If this video tells me I'm going to have to stop drinking coffee, I'm going to lose my mind. Hey, pal, I know what's going through every fiber of your being, but relax. We're going to get through this together. Put down the knife. In an interview, Dr. Paul, Paul, Pal, I wrote Pal. Dr. Paul Saladino, a board certified physician with a board certification as a physician nutrition specialist, gave multiple reasons for why no one on earth should drink coffee for any reason. And if you're on the space station, I respect the dedication, but you aren't getting a pass either, cries an astronaut. Let's listen in and we'll pop open some studies to find out what's what. So and you don't drink coffee? I don't drink coffee at all. Okay, because you've never mentioned it. I've listened to a few of your videos. You've never mentioned coffee. Why don't you drink coffee? Um, okay, so this is a whole thing, and your audience is going to hate me. I don't hate you, Paul, but I really can't speak for them. Just don't take away their coffee. Go for it. Okay. They're going to hate both of us at the end well, of this. Well, they're, they're especially going to hate me, <laughs> because we're, we're, hopefully we're also going to talk about chocolate. You're making this very difficult, Paul. Please stop. Yeah, yeah. But um, so a couple of things about coffee. So what is coffee? Coffee is a seed from a plant. And when I think about plants and the parts of plants that plants don't want you to eat, seeds are probably some of the most highly defended parts of plants. So we're talking nuts, which are seeds, grains. We talked about oats and quinoa, but also wheat, et cetera. People know those grains. Um, beans, like a coffee, quote, bean, which are legumes or black beans or lentils, and then nuts. We talk nuts, grains, seeds, and legumes, right? So those are all seeds because if you plant them in the ground, they grow into a plant. We just call them different things, but they're all seeds. That's a plant baby, meaning that if that gets eaten by an animal and the animal is just says, oh, that tasted great, no problem, and it just gives the animal nutrients, those plants are never going to evolve because those animals are just going to eat the heck out of those seeds. So the, the, the plants will put defense chemicals in the seeds, and seeds are very highly defended. We talk about saponins, we talk about phytic acid, we've talked a little bit about oxalates, but in the case of coffee, you have defense chemicals in the seeds of that plant, um, like anything else. Okay, coffee is a seed and it contains defense chemicals in it that make it unhealthy to consume because the plants are trying to stop animals, us, from consuming them. Makes some sense, and I don't have the background to assess the validity of what plants want or don't want. I'd guess someone with a botany degree or something to that effect might be able to speak to it. I'm clueless. However, I should point out that coffee also contains many beneficial molecules like polyphenols and flavanols. These molecules are intimately tied to improvements in our cells' functionality through the elimination of damaging molecules like free radicals by acting as antioxidants to increase the production of nitric oxide, which reduces blood pressure as well as reducing inflammation. One critically important one is chlorogenic acid, which has been shown many times over according to that science scientific review to stimulate a potent antioxidant pathway in our cells called the NRF2 pathway. This protein, NRF2, when activated, will move into the nucleus of your cells and bind antioxidant genes like H01 and NQ01 and lead to their reading by the gene reading machinery in your cells, thereby making more of these potent proteins that eliminate damaging molecules in our cells as well as breaking down highly reactive heme molecules that would otherwise wreak havoc on our cellular structure and integrity. I'm massively glossing over the number of ways these flavanols and polyphenols have been directly shown to improve cellular function, but that's just a taste. Now, to be fair, we could do the exact same thing with some of the molecules that Dr. Saladino mentions because there are harmful molecules in coffee too. Fortunately, we can still get clear answers, which we'll get to. By the way, I'll reiterate that I don't have any background in how plants want to poison us and stop us from consuming them. But I have this vague memory hearing that some plants are consumed by animals, which leads to their greater propagation, since the animal will end up releasing some seeds out of their back end, populating that plant with fertilizer in a new location. Am I crazy? Again, not my area of expertise, but if you do have some background in this, I'd be keen to know if there's some merit to that idea. We'll consider it the anti saladonian plant hypothesis described by the ever-clueless Professor Verhoeven. Now, 
I just need a, a, a like a pipe and make a have the, like massive sideburns or a, a massive mustache as I scoff at the alternative ideas like this guy. I have no idea who this is. Anyway, moving on, damn it. Caffeine is actually a defense chemical that the plant puts there. Now, interestingly, in the doses we have with caffeine, um, it, it, it reinforces eating the beans because of the way that caffeine affects dopamine in the human brain. And who knows why this is, but it, it, it's a problematic thing for humans, I think mostly from the perspective of sleep. Mm -hmm. So no one wants to hear this, but the quarter life of caffeine is 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours, meaning that if you drink a cup of coffee at let's say 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. in the morning. A lot of people are waiting now, like 90 minutes after they wake up to drink their coffee. So depending when you wake up, when you drink your first cup of coffee, an average cup of coffee has 150 milligrams to 200 milligrams of caffeine in it. So that 200 milligrams of caffeine, if you drink one single cup of coffee, a quarter of that is still in your body affecting the physiology of your brain to initiate sleep, to help you through the sleep stages 12 hours after you drink the coffee. So if you drink coffee at eight or nine, and you go to sleep at nine or 10, you still have about a quarter of the coffee, the quarter of the caffeine, excuse me. So 50 milligrams of caffeine in your body at that point. Now, how is that affecting your sleep stages? This is really the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. So doing that every day. Now that's, that's pretty benign. One cup of coffee, quote benign at 9 a.m. I don't do it. I, and I'm saying benign relative to what I'm going to describe next, which is probably a more typical pattern for people, which is a cup of coffee at eight, a cup of coffee at 10, and maybe coffee at one or two. Now at that point, <laughs> The half-life of caffeine means you've got half of the caffeine is six hours. So if you drink coffee at one or two and you go to sleep at 10 p.m., you've got a lot of caffeine in your body. Mm. And you've got all of the cumulative caffeine in your body. So say you have three cups of coffee throughout the day. That's 600 milligrams of caffeine. And you have them at three different parts throughout the day. You could potentially have 200 milligrams of caffeine still in your body when you go to sleep. Or 150, which is the equivalent of three-fourths of a cup of coffee right before you go to sleep. Okay, here, Dr. Saladino does bring up a great point. It's true that caffeine can affect sleep, and it's not just one's ability to fall asleep, but he astutely points out sleep architecture. Your sleep isn't just you passed out on the couch with Cheetos spilled all over your shirt watching this video. It's a back and forth shifting of gears between the different stages of deep sleep as well as rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. The brain and body must go through these stages with the appropriate amounts of time in each because each stage performs different functions for our biology. It's a fascinating field of science that I hope to produce more investigations on in the future. But for now, just know that the caffeine molecule, due to its similarity to a sleep-promoting molecule, adenosine, will bind to the same receptors as adenosine without activating them and outcompete adenosine, thereby blocking sleep. And even if sleep occurs, it might be a different architecture or quality. This is just one way. There are other mechanisms. So to Dr. Saladino's point, if we look at this systematic review, the researchers compared people told to consume caffeine against people told not to consume caffeine. Those that survived, that is. That was a joke. And we can see across multiple metrics of sleep architecture, the three different non-REM stages and the one REM stage, there are changes. Sleep efficiency is reduced. That's indicated because it moves to the left of that zero line there when people consume caffeine. There's also a bit more of stage one sleep and possibly reduced sleep th stage three sleep. So Dr. Saladino is spot on and Long-term, poor sleep can manifest in a host of diseases. The most robust evidence is behind the total sleep, but there's some murmurings in relation to sleep architecture too. But I would be cautious about over-interpreting those data. Anyway, one easy solution then is to simply drink decaf, right? I mean, problem solved, except you still have to deal with the seed problem. We'll address that shortly. First, let's hear if decaf coffee, which is nonsense, might provide a solution. How do you feel about decaf? So decaf usually has much, much less caffeine. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a much better thing for your body, but there are still other problems with coffee and caffeine, Because right? it's still seeds at the it's end of the It's still a seed. There are mold toxins, right? In a lot of coffees, unless it's a wet That's process. That's what's scaring me right now. I feel like everything's moldy. A lot of grains are moldy because you also get mold on oats. So that's right. back to the oats. We didn't even talk about that with oatmeal. Yet another reason not to eat oatmeal. Even it's organic oatmeal. Okay, mold in our coffee, mold in our oats. It's doing us all harm. 
Let me backtrack here a bit because there's some more discussion to be had on caffeine and sleep. I'm going to cover that in the extended version of this video that you're watching. So if you're interested in more scientific breakdowns, written research reviews, shortened summaries, templates, guides, live sessions with me, and more, consider joining the Physionic Insiders. You get all of that stuff in one place, not to mention the awesome community that's over there. Hope to talk with you over some moldy coffee over there and... The link is in the description if you care to join. Back to moldy coffee murdering us slowly. So decaf coffee eliminates or drastically lessens the sleep issue, but it's still a seed. And now a moldy seed at that. Okay, this happens a lot on social media, but we get so focused on the mechanisms and side quests that we miss the forest for the trees. The real question is, what happens when people consume coffee? Do they die more? Do they experience disease more often? The answer is no. If we look at long term, over decades of coffee consumption, and we compare people who don't drink coffee to people who do drink coffee, there's a reduced risk of cardiovascular mortality. And we can see that because the line goes down from the neutral one on the vertical axis with the coffee consumption on the horizontal axis. We see a similar result looking at death from all causes. Again, reduce risk. This is also after adjusting for many different explanatory factors. There are several randomized controlled trials on coffee as well. Some show seemingly negative effects like increases in blood pressure, but there are also studies indicating overall benefits of cardiometabolic health. The research all considered points in the direction of mixed results on short-term studies and generally improvements in multiple disease risks from long-term studies. So overall, regardless of the molds and the different harmful molecules, the net effect indicates a positive outcome from coffee consumption, within reason, of course. It's still true that drinking coffee later in the day can drastically interfere with your sleep quality. So all in all, I would disagree with Dr. Saladino that coffee is something to be avoided on average. It's generally a positive for health unless abused, much like most things. So like I said, relax. You didn't need to threaten me at the beginning. You can keep drinking your coffee. In fact, I cover if coffee can compare against tea right here. One is a clear winner. I'll catch you over there.